memories. They're what our lives are built around, and learning about memory care can help us all. Welcome to another edition of the What's Next Living Longer, Better, Smarter podcast. This podcast is made possible by IN2L, enriching the lives of older adults since 1999 through its leading engagement and social connection platform. I'm Fred Fishkin, along with Mary Furlong. Hi, Mary. Hi, Fred. Great to be here. It is always great to be here with you. We have some wonderful guests joining us, too. We'll even be talking about baseball. But first, we want to introduce our audience to Mel Barsky. Mel is Director of Business Development at CABHI, C-A-B-H-I, the Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation, powered by Baycrest. Thank you for being here, Mel. Thank you, Fred. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Mary. Mel, it's wonderful to be here with you and to share a little bit about the really important work that CABI does. So tell us a little bit about what happens up there in Toronto. For sure. Thank you, Mary. Well, uh, CABI, Center for Aging Brain Health Innovation, as Fred mentioned, uh, we've been around for six years. We started uh, originally with um, an amalgamation of funding from both private and public entities, uh, governments, uh, entities, the Public Health Agency of Canada at a federal level, uh, the province of Ontario, uh, plus our donor community at Baycrest and a number of corporate partners and entities. And we cobbled together $124 million at the time and we've even had some refunding since. Um, and our purpose was really to look for the best solutions to help uh, aging adults and their caregivers, to look to ways to validate those best solutions, to help bring them to market. And as we've evolved over the past six years, we're moving more to helping those companies, those best solutions to scale and grow and get to market, get into the hands of those who need them. And uh, in the last uh, six years, we have funded well over 300 uh, projects, companies to, to do just that. A strong focus of what we've been looking at is projects and programs, products, tools that help people living with dementia and or their caregivers. Uh, but we're broader than that. We have a lot of projects that um, deal with the longevity market in general. So, um, you know, you've been with us really, Mary, from day one as one of our innovation advisors. And uh, I think you've seen how we've evolved and grown and, you know, we start with a, a grassroots, we've got some calls for innovation that we call them, such as our Spark program, which is meant to create a culture of innovation and to help frontline caregivers who might have an idea about how to take that idea and turn it into a prototype um, through to our MC squared, uh, sorry, let me start with my I2P2 program called Industry Innovation Partnership Program, which really helps to validate those solutions. And we validate them uh, not just in Canada at Baycrest, but across, largely across North America, where we have over 120 trial site partners. And, uh, and when we fund a project, we will place it in, a, in the logical right trial site where we'll test these things. We might test 25% of them at Baycrest here in Toronto and the rest across our trial site partners. And our most recent program that I started to mention was our MC Squared. Uh, Einstein didn't invent that term, MC squared, we did. It stands for mentorship, capital, and continuation. And, uh, and that's really the program where we're, we're treating it more like a social impact kind of a fund where we're, uh, instead of charging administration fee, we're, we're actually taking uh, equity or uh, royalties uh, to help uh, those companies with a project and funding to help them scale and grow their solution and bring it to market. So... And at a high level, that's, that's what Cabby's about. Well, Mel, let me, let me ask you this for our audience. Give us a sense about the, the need for this kind of work. I mean, we, we all have a, a sense generally. We've all been touched in one way or another. But how important is this? Well, Fred, that's, that's a, a big question. There's so many ways to tackle that question. I mean, largely just as uh, our society is aging and getting older, uh, and you look at different societies around the world, Japan is a perfect example, or China and these other countries where they have aging societies. People are living longer, partly because of improved health care uh, and, and other reasons. But as we're living longer, 
um, there's more and more needs for assistance as we reach those super senior years. So we call them older elders. And as you're getting you know, a, a populations around the world that are living longer, you need more solutions for them, such as uh, think, tools to support their caregivers or to support those people as they're aging. Um, the importance is really not just to live longer, but it's also to live better and live an improved quality of life. So some of the solutions, many of the solutions we're looking for to address those kinds of needs uh, where, you know, our parents or grandparents might have thought that as you get older, you ultimately just go into a congregate care senior living uh, center and, and that's where you stay until you die. That's not what the way of the future is. As I'm at the tail end of the baby boomers, but as my generation and above are starting to enter our, our more senior years, we want to live a better quality of life, meaningful life. So the importance is not just about um, helping people uh, that might have dementia, it's helping them live a more meaningful, better quality of life. So there's a lot of reasons why it's important to focus on this area. You can look at statistics such as in China where they had a one child policy for so many years that they don't have enough children to be caregivers for their older family members. And uh, so, you know, that's a, a microcosm, a large microcosm where there's like 200 million people in China over the age of 55 today. And in 20 years from now, that's forecast to be over 500 million seniors. So when you see those kind of huge demographic shifts, you need technology to help uh, play a role in facilitating improving quality of life and care uh, for, our, for our older adults or for us as we enter those senior years. So this is three years now I've been going to the CABI Summit and I was so impressed with Dr. Alson Sekuler's lecture to the public about memory issues. So tell us the size of the market, how many people, and then what were some of the findings that Allison shared this year or that the research scientists shared? Because I think this is where we have to deep dive deeper. I mean, part of my uh, excitement about being an advisor to CABI is to be able to stay current on these research findings. You know, we split up uh, our conference this year into two days where it used to be one day in the past. And Mary's not only attended, but really you underestimate it. You've been a co-host with us for every year and, uh, and come up here. The first year, last year, it switched to a virtual event with about 48 hours notice um, and uh, just because of the COVID uh, pandemic. And this year, by design, it was meant to be a two-day uh, online conference. The first day was really focused and catered to the older adult. We're launching a, a program called LEAP, which is meant to be a technology platform for older adults to attend. So a lot of the focus of day one was um, uh, talks and speakers uh, really related to being a caregiver, being an older adult and technologies for them. Uh, whereas day two was more about our pitch competition and uh, our competitions, plural. Uh, and it was really more about the business of aging. So uh, day two is more focusing on um, pitch competitions with a specific purpose and focus. And uh, we really narrowed down some interesting projects um, by taking uh, a bid where we have a, an open call for innovation we had over 43 applicants. We narrowed that down to 20 that presented at the summit. And uh, we've narrowed that down further to our top six companies, uh, hopefully to be, to be funded. Within there, some of the, the numbers and breakdown in demographics is actually interesting that, you know, one of the things we're looking at is not just the projects to support the longevity market, but we're also trying to support uh, diverse innovators to bring a diverse background of innovation uh, to the um, to the industry and to the market, because we have seniors from all different backgrounds, so it's important to have innovations that support them all too. So this this cohort of funding, um, just looking at some stats of our uh, uh, top twenty companies, we had eight of them were from female founders, nine of them were companies uh, with founders or co-founders that are visible minorities, and uh, 
and uh, and a couple of companies from the LGBT LBGTQ community and uh, and founders uh, co-founders with disabilities. So we're trying to show that we've got a cross range of innovators coming into our portfolio that are coming up with technologies, programs, solutions that also support a broad and diverse audience. So those would be some important metrics. Now, one of the things we've seen during the COVID is that people are paying attention to their cognitive health. Well, I mean, I started playing online bridge as an example, just to keep my, well, not that my work doesn't keep my brain active, it certainly does, but you want to keep focused when it was so, we were so many months at home and you have a, a pathway for older adults that want to get involved to join your program, right? So some of our podcast listeners might want to participate. Absolutely. Yeah. So we started this, we launched at our summit, a new platform we're calling LEAP. Uh, originally it was supposed to be an acronym or we did, we, thought it might be an acronym that stands for Lived Experience Advisory Panel, but it's, it's more than just that. It's a platform that we're developing to help older adults um, think about um, technology and aging, how they can get involved in this platform and learn about the latest technologies and innovations in the longevity sector. Um, there's gonna be wellness tools on this platform where they can get involved and participate in things that help improve their physical, their mental, their cognitive health. Um, there's gonna be uh, opportunities to give feedback to innovators on their innovations. So it's really getting end user feedback, having the voice of older adults and their caregivers to give feedback to innovators uh, really kind of helping them with uh, design and usability of their solutions to make for better solutions that older adults will be, you know, more willing and interested to utilize. There's um, some co-design effectively within this and an ability to share their innovation solutions on this platform. And it's really a forum to, uh, you know, exchange stories, to learn with each other, um, and if you're interested, I would encourage people to go to uh, cabby.com. It sounds like a sales pitch here. C-A-B-H-I.com forward slash leap, L-E-A-P. And you can learn more about this leap initiative and platform, which we've just launched. Uh, we're doing a kind of, you know, it's uh, the World Health Organization has come out with a, a new mandate that this next 10 years is going to be really the decade of healthy aging. And I think it's really important through platforms such as what we're trying to do with LEAP here to, um, to help promote uh, uh, better health and wellness for older adults and to bring in the voice of older adults globally. Again, diversity of geography, diversity of language and, and every other reason for older adults to maybe get on and get involved in this. Can you, can you tell us at all, Mel, about some of the exciting innovations that, that people might want to know about, if you can touch on one or two anyway? You know, it, it's starting off with some Baycrest homegrown solutions. There's uh, Cognicity is a program that uh, we developed in-house and it's an online assessment tool. But from there, once you sort of learn about your, your cognitive health, and uh, it can lead you to a number of other projects and programs. So we have uh, Baycrest at Home is also one of our partners and, and they're helping by developing a, a suite of solutions that are helping people to live uh, aging at home as long as possible. I think the older term used to be aging in place, but we're using more of the vernacular of aging at home. Um, and, and there's a, a number of solutions that will be there to, to help people, whether it's about you know, um, medication management or accessing care or online health and wellness programs, uh, digital health to connect with your healthcare providers. There's a number of solutions that are in that suite all by itself. Uh, but what we're really looking for on this platform is to bring in up, you know, new solutions and new providers. So we're just launching this pr program now, but we want some of those new solutions and new, the companies that we have in our CABI portfolio, I mentioned is over 300, that those who need input or, or looking for input from older adults, they can actually display their wares on this program too. And if there's innovators out there listening to this podcast, you might also, it's not just the older adult, but if an innovator 
or a corporation is developing a new product tool that they think uh, they would like to get exposure to older adults to review, this is a platform to do that. We're not calling it Cabby, we're calling it Leap, a new brand name, because it's not about Cabby, it's about all the innovators out there and older adults to uh, get on the platform and speak with each other. So Fred, I remember when I first started SeniorNet 30 years ago, and my funder said to me that he had gone to Oklahoma in a station wagon. And when he got there, his relatives were sitting on the porch. And he said he didn't want to be one of the people sitting on the porch. He wanted to be engaged. And when he saw senior net, he said people were actively engaged. And I remember asking a senior net member one day, do you think you can plug in the Macintosh? And he said to me, well, I used to be chief scientist at Rockwell. I think I could plug in the Macintosh. So sometimes people forget the talent, the wisdom, the knowledge of older people. And I love how you're baking that into the co-creation part. And just one other point I wanna make as a cabbie advisor, I'm so excited by your connections from Israel to Japan. You've been quite global in bringing the innovations together. So we see in this podcast, kind of we could be a hub for you to not only know about Cabby, but to know about the important work at HTech Israel, to know about the important work in Japan and to see this innovation. And you've been quite amazing in collecting those innovators uh, globally. But this, this, podcast also is about engagement. So we know you have sports. So over to you, Fred, to talk about kind of the next half of this. And let's let Mel share a sports memory. I know he has one. Right. Well, we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, baseball, but there are all kinds of sports fans, Mel. I don't know how, how into, into the Blue Jays you are up there, but uh, give us what your thoughts are about the just briefly your, your thoughts about your own memories, perhaps, and the role of sports in this whole field of memory care. Uh, very interesting. We had at our summit this year uh, some scientists talking about, um, before we had different uh, activities around dance for exercise, around diet for food. We had a food competition with Chef James Mayer against uh, Chef Anthony Lamas out of uh, the Thrive Center in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, so things like exercise and nutrition and brain health, uh, Mary was talking about, you know, brain activities, learning other languages, et cetera, um, are all important. So on the exercise part, um, uh, although I live in Toronto now, I grew up in the, in the prairies in Canada, in Regina, Saskatchewan. And we usually wanna say Regina, Saskatchewan, people go, what language are you talking about? And out there, there was only one sport that mattered and one team, and that was my Saskatchewan Rough Riders. And I've got the proper hat and that's the S for the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. So they're my team. And growing up with the riders, it was a big community thing. You'd always walk down the street and meet players. In fact, uh, when I was a boy, I played on a, here's the baseball analogy, I played T-ball. 1973, I was a Regina City T-ball champions team, championship team, but not because of my ability, but because all the children of the players from the Saskatchewan Rough Riders football team happened to be on the same baseball team that I was on. So I didn't uh, I think, I don't think I contributed too much to winning that championship, but I thank all the players from uh, my favorite football team, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders. Uh, and anyhow, when I was growing up, one of the volunteer activities I did uh, in high school was I worked with a, a war vet uh, hospital in Regina and we would take war vets um, to the football games. And I thought it was the best charity thing that I could ever do because it made me feel good about what I was doing, taking these uh, war vets to the game. But really I also got front row seats to the game because the wheelchairs were down on the, on the goal lines. And so we got to watch the football games uh, up close and personal. That will be my little sports analogy. So, Mary, it's pretty clear that sometimes with people, loved ones and caregivers who are coping with memory issues and Alzheimer's, there are specific kinds of memories that can create moments of joy and happiness. 
for instance, baseball. And since we've kicked off the 2021 baseball season this month, we have a couple of wonderful guests who can help to explain. From IN2L, it's never too late, president and co-founder Jack York. Great to see you, Jack. Hey, Fred, how you doing? And from the Society for American Baseball Research, John Leonidakis. John chairs the organization's Baseball Memories Group, and he is also a wonderful and well-known film and television producer. Thank you for taking the time, John. Good to be with you all. So let's start with you, Jack. And um, we've had the privilege of going with you into some of the communities that you've traveled in. I know you took a van tour across the United States, and I don't think there's anyone closer inside of assisted living and independent living communities than you, and you create magic. You create experiences for residents and celebrate who they are. And I remember going with you to New Orleans to one of those communities and all the people that were with us said, this was the most important thing we do is really connecting inside. So tell us a little more about what you do and I am too well. Well, and thanks for having me a part of this because I, 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 I love connecting dots of, of things that people don't always connect dots to. And I think that this is so relevant for me personally, the whole baseball context. And I think it kind of ties to the broader picture of, of IN2L. So uh, as you know, Mary, IN2L has been around for 21 years. And, it, and it's funny how sometimes people make it sound so sophisticated what we do or so highfalutin technology wise. You know, all we're trying to do, it has nothing to do with aging. All we're trying to do is just to make people feel joy make people feel relevant with things that matter to them. It doesn't matter. I mean, that's, that's part of human nature. It's got nothing to do with aging. What does have to do with aging is, is the realities of what happens, whether it's cognitive issues with, with dementia, whether it's physical issues, whatever it may be, you have to address that through technology, but it doesn't change just the fundamental context of what brings us joy. And what we try to do as a company is have literally hundreds, tens of thousands of, of different types of content that can connect people to what brings them joy. And baseball is something that brings me joy. So that's kind of the connection of, uh, of, of being a part of this today. How do you bring them that content, Jack? Yeah, you know, I mean, the, really it's, it's, it's very simple. It's just all touch screen icons that you can, the, the person can touch a picture of themselves or a caregiver if, caregiver if they need help. And when you touch the picture, behind your picture is content that's relevant uh, for you. So if it was, if you, I, I always make things with IN12 for ever since we started the company, I just try to tie it to me personally. So if you went to my, if I had an icon in one of our systems, if I was in a community uh, you know, what, regardless of where I am cognitively, behind my picture, you would see a video of my daughter singing. You'd probably see Springsteen singing Born to Run, and you would have Kirk Gibson's home run to beat the A's back in, uh, in 88. And, and if I'm, you know, if I'm down a cognitive decline path, I can just watch that over and over and over again, and I'll be give give me a you know a headset, maybe a little VR to watch these things. I am good for the whole day. So uh, and again, that's what matters to me, which is going to be totally different. What matters to you, Fred? What matters to you, Mary? John and I might be watching some of the same videos on on the baseball side, but it really it's just it's all about making it easy to access and simultaneously making it relevant to where a person is cognitively so it all it all matches up. It's a fun puzzle to put together as far as what IN2L does. You open the door a little bit. You got to tell our audience a little bit more about this daughter singing business. Yeah, no, my, well, I got three great kids and two of them are very musically inclined. But my daughter, I, as Mary knows, I am the obnoxious father with my daughter who got really far up the... Uh, uh, up the American Idol ladder uh, last year, 2019. And um, 
And so I just, you know, I'm, I'm, that brings me joy, just going and hanging out, watching her sing. And she sings all over the place in Southern California, does a lot of stuff nationally. So uh, Perrin York, it's, she's got a cool name. It's kind of like Madonna having a first name that you know. It's Perrin York. And, and five years from now, I will simply be known as Perrin York's father. No one will remember anything about, uh, about this Jack York guy. We oh, need her to sing, take me out to the ball game. You know, I, I remember taking my sons to uh, spring training in Arizona and how much fun that memory was. And families have a lot of memories with baseball, but I'm sort of intrigued by the notion of it. what does a baseball historian do, Fred? And how does that come to play? Well, let's get John in here to talk about that. <laughs> when it comes to baseball, uh, John, uh, our viewers of the podcast. Those of you who are watching it can see a great background that you have. It's not fake, all real stuff. (laughs) And the work that you've been doing is amazing. Give us the overview. Well, I've been a producer in the entertainment industry for 30 years, Um, but I started uh, working as a baseball historian on the side about 15 years ago. And uh, as a filmmaker, I have 10 films in a permanent collection of the Hall of Fame. You see some of the posters here behind me, but in 2018, I heard that this, I'm a member of the Society for American Baseball Research, and a friend of mine told me that the Texas chapter was using baseball as a means of connecting with people with dementia. You know, there's a, they had a saying, when you're talking baseball, you're building community. And I said, what a great idea, because narrative, storytelling, is at the heart of baseball. You know, it's a game where there's time to write things down and talk to your, you know, the person sitting next to you at the game. So, um, and everybody has stories to tell. And so we started it here in Los Angeles in 2018 with our partners, Alzheimer's Los Angeles and the Veterans Administration. And it really took off. Uh, They were surprised as as were we, how engaged people were. We typically have the caregivers participating with um, the people who have dementia or or Alzheimer's. We have a, uh, we basically have everything set up like a baseball game structure, start with player introductions, then we sing the national anthem and then we prompt them with a photograph or tell them, hey, you brought in a baseball today. Tell us about that signed baseball. Tell us the story behind it. And it kind of goes from there. Every session has a theme. And um, we also pre-pandemic, we also had a physical component that we folded into proceedings. I got a bucket of, 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 of wiffle balls and I brought them in and we stood around in a circle. We all played soft toss and then we took batting practice and you haven't lived until you pitch batting practice to a 95 year old person who lights up like a Christmas tree and says, I haven't swung a bat in 75 years. So uh, we've been seeing some very powerful results. Some people are calling what we do very innovative. It's deceptively simple, uh, but we've, we've done this long enough now that we know how to connect with people. And the benefits are that um, you know, the people's uh, self-confidence is increased, their self-esteem, their moods are elevated, um, the, the, the socializing, um, you know, we hear this from the people, our, our partners at Alzheimer's Los Angeles and the VA that, you know, it's like watching a flower bloom. Um, so we've had a lot of success with it and we're very excited about it. Tell us how it spread. Well, it started in 2015 in our, our South Texas chapter, we have 70 area chapters around the United States. We have over 6,000 members. So it started there in 2015. They've done over 100 sessions since then. And then I, I got involved in 2018 and just began it began the program. I learned a lot from them and how they put their program together. We also have other folks who are doing things in Greenwich, Connecticut, um, as well as we had folks we were working with in um, uh, Westchester County, New York, we have a new program that's open. We had we just had a new one open up in San Diego. We have a new one opening up in Cleveland this week, um, and we have some other ones that uh, we're looking to bring online through our members. John, tell us about the kinds of letters you get from families because I've been in a lot of communities and we don't often see things that engage the men. There are some, uh, but. How has this resonated with the men in particular? And what are families saying to you? Well, ours is, uh, we, are, we, are, we are non-gender specific. Everyone is welcome. So we got a letter a couple of weeks ago when I led a, uh, a session in San Diego. Um, I got the next day on Facebook, some woman contacted me and said, 
my mother has dement has had dementia for a long time. And yesterday she was more lucid than I had seen her in years. Thank you. Uh, we had a letter from a woman saying, you're really onto something. My husband has had Alzheimer's for 11 years and we've been involved in a lot of different programs, but this program resonated with him. He's a big baseball fan. It's a chance for him to connect with other baseball fans, other baseball people, people who love the game. And not only that, it was an activity they could do together as a couple. She said, with my husband's uh, you know, advancement in Alzheimer's, there aren't a lot of things we can do together. This is one of them. Curious, what is it, do you think? And this is for both of you, John and Jack. What is it about baseball that can have this kind of effect where maybe other things, not so much? Yeah, let, let, let me answer it like, specifically and John can speak globally. I mean, for me specifically, I, mean, I, I, my dad died and I get choked up even talking about it. my dad died probably 30 years ago. And we would, I don't know a lot about what, you know, what he was really thinking in his life. I, you know, there's lots about my dad. I don't know, but I know exactly how he liked a hot dog at a Dodger game. And we would, and I remember as a kid, uh, he got season tickets for his company and they got like, I don't know, like 16 games or something. And I would sit down with him and look at the schedule and plan for hours. What would be the games that we could go to? And, and, when, and when my dad was dying, when my dad was dying on his deathbed, we're talking about the Dodgers. We're, we're, we're talking, I mean, it was, it was the most, um, you know, honestly of, of my entire as I look back at my incredibly positive relationship with my father, I think about the Dodgers more than I think about virtually anything else. We it was section O, row 30, seat one, two, three, and four that we went to for, for 12 years in a row. And, and it was, um, you know, it, it just, it, it's a, it's a, it, it, it's a, if, if you don't get it, you don't get it. It's not like you're trying to make somebody else feel that way. It's, that's what really made me tick with my dad. And I think that, uh, you know, to this day, if I hear a, a tape of Vin Scully talking uh, or Vin Scully doing a play-by-play -play of a Dodger game, I can be 10 years old with the radio tucked under my bed sneaking my parents knew I was awake but I was thinking I was getting away with sneaking a you know staying up late listening to a transistor radio uh, of a Dodger game so for me it is just a a surreal uh j just a whole window into my own my own life my own history and I can get there so quickly and I never pretend to be an expert on dementia I know a zillion experts on dementia but I think fundamentally uh, if, if I if I take that journey, I tell you, that kind of memory is so deeply ingrained uh, in my soul that I know it'll give me joy uh, wherever I am. So I think John can speak a thousand times better than I can on the bigger picture. But for me, it's a very it's a very personal, real sensation. Just a quick question here, Jack. Do you remember the year that the Giants beat the Dodgers? No, I have blocked that part of selective, <laughs> part, of, part of the joy of memories is I, a lot of things I block out of my memory bank. And, uh, and no, I don't, I don't, I don't remember that. What, what team are you talking about? I don't even know. I never heard of them before. Because, you know, my aunt who was, I was partly named after was Mary O'Malley. And she was the nurse for the Giants when they came from Brooklyn to San Francisco. And she had seven boys and they all worked at the ballpark and then later at the airport. So you could always call an O'Malley uh, when you were there. So, but it does bring back these memories, right? Like you had to get the peanuts, you had to get there early, all those things. Oh yeah, the, the smell, the every, every sense imaginable. And I love hearing the stuff John's doing because yeah. it totally resonates. Well, John, your, your response to this. Yeah, well, and Jack really hits nail on the head. Uh, there are a few sports. I mean, sports in and of itself is a way to connect people together. Baseball in particular, um, it's so evocative. And it's the, the memories that have been generated over decades. You know, most of the people who have dementia are in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. And baseball was uh, the number one sport in America 
the post-World War II golden era of the 1950s and 60s and 70s. And this, those are the, the games, those are the players, those are the teams. They remember there was a guy in our Texas chapter who was a big Red Sox fan who had terrible dementia. He could name the starting lineup for the 1948 Boston Red Sox without fail. Um, so I think that baseball has that particular magic to it more than any other sport. Uh, because there's a lot of intangibles about the game. You have these iconic American heroes, Sandy Koufax, Willie Mays, Mickey Mantle. Um, these are you know, part of American lore and Americana. And that's sort of a, you know, a, a, a weaving that goes through our lives as Americans, especially those of us who are over the age of 60. So it resonates a lot. Um, it resonates very strongly. I think with people um, who are, you know, 70 and older, when we bring these programs to them and, and we tailor them to them, our, you know, we'll talk about what was, uh, we'll talk about the year of baseball in 1965 or the year that Denny McLean won 31 games. Uh, uh, and they remember these things. They remember these moments they could do. I knew where I was sitting when Bill Mazeroski hit the home run to end the 1960 World Series. And uh, just like Jack can tell you where he was when, um, you know, Gibson. Uh, when Kirk Gibson hit his, his iconic home run. These are huge moments in people's lives and they're indelibly imprinted on their brains. And, uh, and, and, we, and we see this in evidence in all of our meetings. Uh, Fred, I wanna talk a little bit about the technology interface that Jack is using and the team at IN2L because you're about to have a massive growth spurt and now you have a tablet that connects people, correct? Yeah, I think, you know, I think that it, it's it, it's funny because we started the company, we had no idea what was coming, but you kind of just assumptively figure out the technology is going to catch up to the dream. So it again, it's like I was talking before, it's just the ability to get a person what they want at just the touch of a finger or a soon to be a voice command. And the, just the, the, the immense amount of data that's out there now to be able to you know, look up YouTube clips of the moments that John's talking about. And, and again, everybody's going to have, it, it's not baseball for baseball's sake. I mean, it is to a certain extent, but it is, is what's relevant to that person. I'm not going to want to watch the Giants win in the, the World Series. I don't want to watch the Dodgers. So you, to be able to have this world of content kind of uh, coincide with this explosion or with the capability of technology is, is just a miracle. I mean, it's a miracle to be able to go to YouTube and type in a game 15 years ago and have it, it pop up. And who knows where the heck it'll be five years, 10 years, 15 years from now with holographic technology. Gibson will probably be standing right next to me when he, when he hits the home run. But it, it really, I think what we, again, what we try to do, and uh, you know, John, you said it too, it, it's, it, there's a simplicity to all this stuff. It's not as complicated as people make it. We're just trying to make it really easy, easy to get access to the, the content that, that are, that's meaningful for people. And I, Mary, I appreciate you keep on bringing up I2L because I want to just keep talking about the Dodger infield of the 70s. I know you do a good job. Of, <laughs> I, I of have to tell game. you, I was <laughs> at the Dodger game the year the streaker came. Remember that? Oh, that, that, that was, there was a few of them. There was a few in of them. The, and the stands with my brother-in-law. I think but, Fred was one of them. <laughs> <laughs> ah. By the way, um, Jack, we had Ron Say as a special the, guest. The Penguin, number 10, third <laughs> base. <Penguin. laughs> you got it, baby. You know, he came, and, and basically, when the pandemic hit, our program exploded over Zoom because it's largely conversation-based. And uh, because people didn't have to commute, um, you know, we had them all there virtually, but we had Ron say, uh, talk about, and people just got to ask him questions and, and Ron has had someone in his family who had dementia. So it was meaningful to him. And it was at that point, you know, we're all just the same folks because, you know, he had the same problem that all these other people are dealing with right now. So, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll fold those people into our programs too. It's obviously better if we're doing it in person with people, but um, we, we, because of the Zoom technology, we have been able to continue our programs and see it flourish during the pandemic. You know, there's been a light shined on how important engagement 
in senior living engagement for all of us is an engagement around our passions. And there's still a bit of fear of who comes in and who goes out. So I think it's kind of uh, appropriate that we kick off this baseball season with this show. And I think there will be people engaged in all sorts of different ways. I have to share a baseball story, Fred. Uh, My doctor was Vince DiMaggio Jr. I don't know if Jack knows that. No, no, that's funny. My baby, my my son Michael was due in May and uh, Dr. DiMaggio fell off his horse in April and broke, broke both hands and so he couldn't deliver the baby but here was uh dr dimaggio visiting me in the hospital two hands in casts and i've always <laughs> thought that was kind of special to have a dimaggio uh as part well, that of was that. vince jr is that vince jr i i think they yeah there were three three yeah, one because, was a doctor, because but. vince senior was a very good baseball player who quit baseball to become an opera singer if you can believe it what a talented family, right? They're, they're local near us. Uh, okay, over to you, Fred. Really, really wonderful. I got tons of baseball stories too. And, and John, boy, do I love to throw a wiffle ball. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that the curve, the, the sinker. Oh, you got yeah, it all. Yeah. Everybody, everybody <laughs> could be with a wiffle ball. Everybody could be Sandy Koufax with the, the big bender. Oh, Sandy Koufax. There's an open invitation for all of you to come by my house. We take BP in front of the house with wiffle balls all the time. You know, I love that. And one thing I want to say, I visited a few friends recently, and I'm always surprised, but not so much so, to see that they have those fake cardboard pictures of themselves in uniform sitting around the table in their house. And there is this, uh, Norman Perlstein once said to me, you know, baseball is like a national religion, or sports is a national religion in the U.S., this is thank you for the magic you bring to the lives of older people, including us. <laughs> We're just getting started. And and Jack, what's next on the horizon for you at IN2L? Well, well, in the 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 merge of IN2L and baseball, all this stuff, and, and it, it's funny talking about this. Mary can relate to it, but my uh, the history of things that I've done in my life that are a little outlandish. Uh, whether it be IN2L, whether it be Francis in Cameroon and the and the goats, whether it be the 6020 tour where we drove a van all over the country doing carpool karaoke with, with hundreds of nursing home residents, uh, most of them living with dementia, is I always have a tendency when I haven't thought something through is I tell people about it. Because if I tell enough people, then I have to do it. And, and then because then you can't go back on it. And so what I have had is a dream for so many years. And now I am I'm officially saying it. I've said it to my friends. This is the first time I've said it in a public venue is in 2022 next year. I want to go to every baseball stadium, every professional baseball stadium in the country and probably mix in a few minor league stadiums for off markets. But I want to go to every stadium and bring a few residents. And then my two passions are people living with dementia and veterans. So some combination of veterans, people living with dementia, and also trying to find players of that generation. So when you're bringing up Ron Say, like a perfect example, but I would love to go to every, or I shouldn't say I would love to, I'm going to go to every stadium and put together a handful of people and just celebrate the the game that's in front of us, but the conversations that would take place between the players and the residents just reliving the the whole stories in their life, like what John and I talked about. Somehow John will be involved in this too. We don't know how that'll work out yet, but we'll figure that out. But I don't have the, you know, none of it's planned yet. None of it's thought through, but I'm 100% uh, committed to do this and I think that uh, it'll, you know, I want to kind of film the whole, you know, get a get a 20 something videographer or, if I, or talk John into it to, uh, to just film the whole thing and, and see what kind of stories come out of it. And again, like, like I and 12, like the 6020 tour, like Francis and Cameroon, you start with an idea, you have no idea where it's going to go, but you're sure as hell glad you do it uh, when, when it's all said and done. So I uh, now... Now that I've publicly made this announcement uh, on Mary's show and Mary and Fred's show, which is appropriate, 
uh, it's, it's time to start thinking about how to, uh, how to make it happen. So anybody out there who's interested, reach out to us. And John and I will be talking later about how to tie it together with some of the context that, uh, that he has. Well, I want to help support it, and I want to go to some of the games with you. So I'm going to put it on my bucket list for 2022. That's the kind of travel I want to do. Uh, there's some stadiums that I really want to go to. Uh, gosh, another memory. I'm going to just share it, Fred. I was part of the White House uh, group in the Clinton administration um, that helped internet and technology and libraries come together. You know, 30 years later, we're back looking at broadband access so that people can bring all these things together. But we got to go to the San Diego Stadium and Gene Simon, who was married to Senator Paul Simon, threw out the first pitch. And we were in the dugout with LeVar Burton, who was also on the council. Yeah. And it was one of the best memories. And one of the uh, commissioners was the Librarian of Congress. And he had an argument with a pitcher. And I'll never forget that, you know? And he had pitched for Yale. And my son, Daniel, still refers to him as the guy that pitched for Yale. So, you know, you have these stories because you remember the arguments, you remember the people. It's magic, right? And you're going to bring all that back for people. Yeah, and also, I think, you know, not to get political, but I think what I love about baseball, and you, you know, you want it to stay that way, is that it transcends politics. You know, you, yeah. you, you, you're at a game and you all of a sudden you're, you know, walking down the street, you, you know, you don't even look people in the eye half the time you go to a baseball game, you're wearing the same Jersey. Somebody hits a home run. You are high five and you are <laughs> yeah. hugging you or whatever. It makes yeah. no difference. What anything about that person, all that matters is that for that moment, you are, you're unified. And I think that that's another part of, I think the joy of baseball that's so relevant right now. And also, Jack, I have to say that's the gift I've seen you bring personally. You know, I know we have had some other spontaneous moments where you we don't see disability. We only see enthusiasm. We only see yeah. um, expertise and joy and coming together. So we need to find new ways to do that in all sorts of passion projects that people might have. You know, well, I wish... I wish people who are funding would look at these ideas, both your tour and the baseball history and see these as worthwhile causes. Um, over to you, Fred. Well, John and Jack, congratulations really on, on the work that both of you are doing. Just tremendous. Cracker Jack ideas, a real home run. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Thank you, Mary. Well, Mary, we've got some wonderful baseball stories of our own. One of, one of my favorite baseball memories comes from way back in 1969 when I was working at a college radio station and the, and the program director somehow finagled press passes to cover the World Series, the Mets versus the Orioles. So there I was, 17 years old, waiting to get into the Mets locker room to do interviews after game three, which put the Mets up two games to one. Standing behind me was the legendary sportscaster, Howard Cosell. So I got up the courage, fumbled around a little bit and said to Mr. Cosell, uh, would you mind if I talk to you about the World Series and your predictions for the college radio station? And he turns around, looks at me and he says, go right ahead, son. It's probably <laughs> the biggest thrill you'll ever have. <laughs> And we've got a great photo here. I want you to tell us about oh, this. So this is a photo taken at the opening day of the Giants baseball season. And here on the right, you probably recognize the smile, are my parents, Dan and Seal Simpson, and their dear friends, the Gardners and the Kimbros. And this was... Uh, written up in the San Francisco Chronicle, and uh, you could see how dressed up they got for the game. I thought it was so cute that they had their hats and 
it was a really big uh, event in their lives to kick off baseball season. And, you know, I have to give credit to that generation because they not only went to the games, but they helped build the, you know, support the franchises. I remember when the A's came to Oakland and it was very exciting to, to see these teams and to watch that. But boy, does that bring back a good memory for me. Fred. And it's kind of funny the way it's almost like you mentioned religion before, but but allegiance to baseball teams or football teams, for for that matter, is passed down from generation to generation in families <laughs> yeah. very often. So right. even when people move far away, they stay they stay fans of a certain team. Well, it's funny you say that because I was struck by what Jack was saying about his dad in in the final days, how they still talked about baseball. And I lost a friend last year, and I I. They, as they were cleaning out the house, I asked to have some of the um, programs to look through because even the advertising is interesting and the, pl the player's name. So it does take us right back. Well, this is exactly what I was hoping our show would do, Fred. Well, before we leave, Mary, I want to let our audience know about the What's Next Longevity Business Academy. It takes place from April 20th through June 8th. Really a great opportunity for learning. Yes, if you are enjoying our podcast and you're thinking about pivoting into the longevity market as a career, you, you could learn so much in this sprint of eight-week sessions. So we bring the brightest people together, and uh, it's very exciting. MaryFurlong.com is the place to go for more info. We want to thank our guests, Mel Barsky, Jack York, and John Leonidakis for a wonderful discussion on a topic that touches so many. Also, thank you to our sponsor, IN2L, enriching the lives of older adults since 1999 through its leading engagement on social connection platform. And thank you for listening or watching, and please stay safe.